And let's turn to our fourth paper, fourth and last paper in this session by Carol Beer. Carol's a visiting scholar with the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. We do have theology coming in everywhere here in Berkeley, California. And concurrently, she's also a research associate at the Textile Museum in Washington, DC, where she served as curator for Eastern Hemisphere collections from 1984 to 2001. And it is to mathematics that we are now going to turn to, do, to with Carol. She's going to speak to us today on overlapping decagons on the Iranian plateau, intersecting histories of architecture and mathematics. Please join me in welcoming Carol Beer. Looking widely, looking closely. Circles of equal dimension, tightly packed, naturally combine in two ways. One method yields centers that form a square grid. The other method yields centers that form a triangular grid. In both cases, the circles are tangent. That is, a line drawn from between the centers is collinear with the point where the circles touch one another. Here, you can see that the square grid established by tight-packed circles, post sassanian dirhams, with crescents and stars at the cardinal points, relates to the woven textile patterns with tangential circles represented in wall paintings at Afrasiab. Note the tangential roundels on the front panel of the garment on the left with the boar's heads, as well as the hems and facings and the bolt of silk held by the ambassador here on the right. In the explanatory diagram, I've expanded the line widths of the axes to highlight the square grid that is established by laying out silver dirhams. The way that al Khwarezmi went about arranging some of the problems he addressed in his seminal work, Kitab al-Jabr al which laid the foundations for what today we still call al-Jabra. Algebra. A simple square grid yields angles of 90 degrees. Crossing the squares results in angles of 90 degrees, 135 degrees, and 225 degrees, all based on the simple mathematical fact that a circle has 360 degrees. Extending the lines, adding color, and a third dimension can quickly complicate the situation visually, but the underlying grid and pattern structure holds. In these two instances, one modular tile is molded along with an eight-pointed boss, and that has been used to achieve the star and polygon pattern based on a square grid. Other patterns with square grids are set on an oblique axis in which the 90 degree angles are preserved. In a regular triangular grid, also based on the geometry of the circle, the angles are all 60 degrees and multiples of 60 degrees when looked at together. By selecting centers on a triangular grid, one may establish a rhombic grid or a hexagonal grid the angles of which are multiples of 60 degrees. Such basic mathematical relationships often underlie the play of pattern in Islamic art. Again, the situation is much more complicated quickly, as in this jolly at Shangri-La, where there is both an articulated hexagonal grid and a coincidental structure of overlapping hexagons or here with intersecting polygons. It is this aspect of Islamic art on which I want to dwell. So far, the two systems we've discussed are treated at length by Isama Saeed in a book published posthumously, edited by Tariq Aburi and Keith Critchlow, which El Saeed labeled these two systems, the root two system based upon a right isosceles triangle half a square with 45, 45, and 90 degrees uh, angles, the basis for all square grids, and the root 
three system based upon a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, half an equilateral triangle, the basis for all triangular grids or alternatively rhombic and hexagonal grids, multiples of 60 degrees, all proportional systems that depend upon the geometry of the circle, any circle. What Elbori and Critchlow admittedly didn't publish, however, was as Said's work on the Route 5 system, related to what is elsewhere known as the Golden Mean, a proportional system also present in many works of Islamic art, also based on the geometry of the circle, with a pentagon inscribed, shown here in a derivative pattern with a central 10-pointed star. The complexities associated with five-fold and 10-fold symmetries deserve much more than another lecture, even an entire course. The subject is treated but in a simplified manner by Eric Brugge in his 2008 publication, Islamic Geometric Patterns, where he gives step-by-step -step instructions for the construction of a pentagon using compass and straight edge in relation to patterns with pentagons, decagons, and 10-pointed stars, that is 72 to 108 degrees, and factors and multiples of these. But note that for the cover of his book, which we see here, he has constructed a pattern with 12-pointed stars set within a network of overlapping hexagons. Complicated patterns with five-fold and 10-fold symmetries are more fully explored, rather, by Keith Critchlow in his 1976 classic work on Islamic geometric patterns. Such patterns have been elaborated upon more recently, partly as a result of new findings. Fast forward to 2011, when Dan Schechtman at Haifa's Technion received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of what he has called quasi-crystalline patterns, that is, patterns that are non-periodic without global repetition. The press announcement makes reference in the Nobel Prize uh, announcement to medieval tile, medieval Islamic tile mosaics, which are among those publicized by Peter Liu and Paul Steinhardt in an article that appeared in Science Magazine in 2007. Patterns at Maraga that had also been studied earlier by Emil Makoviki and Jay Bonner. Liu, a physics graduate student at Harvard who also studied with Guru Nejipolu, identified and clearly drew the underlying set of tiles that play counterpoint to the interlaced polygonal network. And he named these Giri tiles, for me an anomalous term, but that now seems pervasive in mathematical literature. Whether the main pattern that surrounds the building is actually non-periodic or quasi-crystalline has been hotly debated, particularly in mathematical literature. And I admit that I jumped into a fray with a short article entitled, Taking Sides But Who's Counting? to point out that the monument itself is decagonal, not octagonal, as has so often been published, a determination that I based on the annotated 1937 field drawing of Myron Bemmon Smith, now in the Freer and Sackler archives. Before me, Abbas Danishvari had also made note of the building's decagonal prismatic structure. Its decagonal plan would seem to reinforce the notion that the mathematics of this building and its decoration was significant in its time. Let us stop briefly to examine a portion of that main pattern that surrounds the Gumbadi Kabud in Maraga of the late 12th century, as drawn here by Eric Brugge. In art historical literature, such patterns might be described as geometric, strap work, interlaced, and it's generally considered to fall within the category of ornament or decoration. In mathematics, it might be called a tiling or a polygonal network, more specifically a compass and straight edge construction or rusty compass work, that is, with a fixed opening, 
compass with a fixed opening. More recent studies have focused on the underlying subgrid, which interlaces the polygonal network at midpoints, and have used, therefore, such terms as grids and subgrids, dualized grids, midpoint construction, and now lose Geary tiles. Years ago, but not in relation to this particular pattern, Wasma Chorbaja had proposed that one construction drawn in an anonymous text appended to a late copy of the 10th century treatise by Bustani on geometry needed by craftsmen could be interpreted to yield a five-pointed star, Khatam Muhammad, by means of overlapping decagons, Wasma's reconstruction you see on the right. I have taken this idea and extended it to the plane, overlaying a reconstruction drawing of Gumbadi Kabud's pattern by Peter Saltzman. Notice in particular here, towards the middle of that reconstruction drawing, uh, five-pointed stars that are looped. Overlapping decagons might be used to explain the otherwise ineffable interior construction of the North Dome of the Masjid Ijoma Isfahan, dated 1088. This notion of overlapping polygons that I have developed in a preliminary fashion, however, runs counter to ways that patterns have been studied in the 20th century by means of symmetry and grids and tessellations emph emphasizing, quote, no gaps and no overlaps. In my study of the many patterns that cover the two 11th century octagonal tomb towers at Hara Khan, notice particularly the tympanum above the entrance to the later western tower on the left where my ruminations and analytical sketches demonstrate a high degree of ambiguity in how this pattern may be read in several ways. To highlight the pentagon squares and triangles of its composition, as you see in the upper left, arranged with glide reflection symmetry, as you see in the middle top, or the square grid that underlies this symmetry in the upper right as well as two opposing grids of non-regular hexagons, the two lower images on the left and middle, arranged both vertically and horizontally, and divided to obtain a most unusual early tessellation of pentagons, non-regular pentagons, which correlate closely with another of the patterns that appears in the same undated manuscript appended to the late translation of Bustani's 10th century text on geometry needed by the craftsman. My analytical sketch on the left shows a derivation of this pattern from overlapping octagons. Another unique example is the tympanum of the Gumbadi Surk at Marahe, dated by historical inscription to the mid 12th century, whose tympanum exhibits three sets of overlapping polygons with a single center. Intersecting nonagons, let me go back for a moment. Intersecting nonagons, the nine sided figures highlighted with turquoise glaze one of the earliest appearances, it's the set on the bottom, one of the earliest appearances of glaze in Seljuk period. Intersecting hexagons in the upper left and intersecting dodecagons with the analyses published in my article that appears in the current Nexus Network Journal, Architecture and Mathematics. Further analysis of this pattern, which I presented in Istanbul a couple of uh, uh, months ago, yields information about its probable means of construction in clay based upon three modular shapes repeated to form the whole with the dodecagonal strips added as the last step. 
This is the earliest use of such modularity that I have so far located, but there may be more. By engaging in such pattern play, one may begin to recognize aspects of intricacy and complexity that are, in essence, quite simple. They may result, as we have seen, from the iterative manipulation of a single module with only one or two variables in form, color, orientation, or placement. But the mathematics is clearly palpable. The patterns are not merely decorative and ornamental, and the inferred processes of construction provide evidence of playful exploration and experimentation, yet requiring very careful planning for the firing, cutting, and glazing of bricks and other ceramic elements. The many extant monuments in Iran and Central Asia, of which we've examined only briefly five, seem to exhibit internal developments in the understanding of geometry and suggest a visual discourse that is related to contemporary mathematics at the time as it was being developed and advanced in Baghdad, Mosul, Aleppo, Marahe, and elsewhere. I leave you with an almost final slide, the tympanum of the earlier tower at Kharakhan in which overlapping hexagons map interlaced 12 pointed stars, each surrounding the name Allah, adding a theological dimension yet to be explored. But you may have captured in this short presentation my concern with overlapping decagons to describe the intersecting histories of architecture and mathematics. And now perhaps you too may recognize the many patterns of overlapping polygons, hexagons, octagons, triangles, and squares that visually recall the mathematical context of Nasr al-Din Atusi and his colleagues and their predecessors at Marahe. Thank you. I thank you not only for your informative paper, but also for your very prompt attention to the time. That was, very, that was quite within our time frame. So I think we have time for a couple of questions, if anyone would like to ask questions about the intersection of mathematics, or are we all interested in a coffee break? <laughs> Has food taken over our, our, our love of, of learning? Um, one thing I will then ask is the fudge factor. Um, it struck me on when you had drawn the tiles on the second Maragay tomb, or the earlier Maragay tomb. Okay. Uh, hearts, uh, no, Mar uh, Maragay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that one of the things that people could do was put wider or thinner um, terracotta strips in between to make these pieces fit together, which would suggest to me that it was not so much complex mathematics as trial and error. Um, and so I wondered if you would like to speak to that. Yeah, the difficulty is I could speak for hours <laughs> on, on that subject. Um, the, but the fudge factor, let me just address the fudge factor without the clay for just a mm -hmm. moment. And that is that the drawings that I made are what I consider to be analytical sketches. They are analytical, but they are not constructions. And what I am so fascinated by is that all of the monuments that I have studied are so much more precise in clay than what I can achieve with sketches. So there's something more going on than trial and error. Um, let me leave it at that. Okay. And Sheila, you okay, have a question. I, I have a question more. just about the patronage of those monuments in Marare. And what do uh, you know? I once knew and forgot of something. Um, and I'd like to know if, if we know anything about the patrons, then do we know anything about their connection and awareness of these treatises, this excitement about um, geometry and these people? That's my question, very inarticulately posed. For Gumbadi Surk, I'm not, um, I'm not aware that we know the patron, but we know the name of the architect. For the two monuments at Harahan, 
We know the name of what we think is one architect. There's a minor change, but it seems to be the same uh, Amakio Sanjani. In terms of the, and for Gumpadi Kabud, we don't have the name of the architect. In terms of the patron, um, Sheil has worked closely with the um, attempted reading of the names in the towers at Harakan, and it appears to have Turkic elements, but my recollection is that we haven't yet established. It's some sort of emir, but we, don't, we can't identify this particular person. We can identify what class he's in. I'm just um, really trying to get at this sort of intellectual right. milieu and, that well, creates these. And of course, we, we think we know a lot about Baghdad, yeah. but in these other places, particularly since these mathematicians like Al-Khwarizmi and others are coming from um, Iran and East, uh, that's what I'm getting after. Yeah, there, there's two ways that I think would be useful in a short amount of time to address this. One, I've been trying to wrap my head around what was going on in Marahe in terms of an intellectual community before Hulagu Khan identified it as his, ca his earliest capital in Iran and where he established um, a, an astronomical observatory, which he put Nasir al -Din Atusi as the head of. Um, there are accounts of, after the sack of Baghdad, um, the removal of some books from the library that were brought to Marakha, and I don't know whether everything in Alamut had been destroyed or there was preservation of materials, but Nasir al-Din was protected and brought to um, the new court. And the question is, in, in mathematical and scientific terms, what became a very important school of mathematics of Marare post mid 13th century, I am arguing had precedence and presence in Marare before and not only on the basis of the tombs and their sculptures. You said the second tomb, but there are five mm -hmm. tombs there, so the your numbering tomb. and yeah. mine were not in sync. But Suravardi had been there in terms of philosophy and theology and his Hikmet al-Ishraq addressing issues of light. Um, Nezami had um, dedicated one volume, one copy of his half Pekar to um, Aladin Atabeki, who was ruling in Marahe. Uh, a Jewish philosopher from Cairo, uh, Samawal, had come and settled in Marrakech in the late 12th century. So there was quite a bit going on, and I think I can forge an argument for a mathematically aware community in Marrakech in the late 12th century. There were also um, the mathematicians who trained Nasser ad had been working in Aleppo, Mosul, and Baghdad before then. So whoa, there's way more of this that can be studied. One thing I'd like to mention, though, I had made allusions in my talk. Khwarezmi is several centuries earlier, but his algebra was still being worked on and expanded and studied. And this is a moment in the history of mathematics where we see a transition from Indian arithmetic and Greek geometry and new Islamic algebra coming together and forging in mathematical treatises of one, one of which is that so uh, anonymous treatise appended to the late version of Bustjani. But I think that this same transition that relates to polynomials and extraction of roots is gonna be visible if we can link it more closely in the arts, and what I'm arguing is this approach to the study of pattern with overlapping polygons may yield more than we have so far been able to establish links. Well, I think it just remains then for me to thank our speakers. <laughs> to also just let me thank our sponsor. This panel was sponsored by the Aga Khan program, and I should have mentioned that at the beginning. But to say in general how looking closely has produced some very interesting results. So again, let me say thank you to the speakers, and let us have a five-minute break. Five minutes to stand up and stretch, and then we'll be back. Thank you. Don't take no,